Okay, hi, I'm Kathy Itomura. This is, uh, you've come to the Burbank Valley Garden Club's um, final presentation of the Gottlieb Garden Lectures or presentations. Um, the, I, I'm very, very uh, grateful to the Gottlieb Native Garden Foundation uh, for each of these splendid presentations. All of this made possible through their generosity. And each presentation comes with a book. Um, we will give away copies of uh, the book that is related to this presentation called California in a Vase at the end of today's presentation. So California in a Vase was written by David Bryant, who's Director of Visitor Experience at California Botanic Garden. The California Botanic Garden, which we used to know as Rancho Santa Ana Botanic Garden, um, is a co-publisher with uh, the Gottlieb Native Garden uh, for this book. And it's a gorgeous book. You will want to stay for that. Um, our speakers today, um, one speaker really, is Linda Prendergast. She is the native design volunteer of, uh, in charge of the native design volunteers at California Botanic Garden. And she's going to be assisted by Lucinda McDade, who's the executive director at the California Botanic Garden. So, uh, very high powered presenters today and they're going to Linda is going to show us how to use California native plants in floral arrangements in every season. Um, we've been asked to please use the chat function. Um, you can find it if you if you use your uh, you know your scroller to scroll around the screen and put your question in there. Lucinda will monitor those that chat function. And if we have any technical difficulties, uh, California Botanic Garden has graciously provided Phil and Danielle, and I've already learned things from them. So with that, I wanna turn it over to Linda Prendergast. Who's going to turn it promptly over to Lucinda McDade? Very good. Lucinda? I wonder if Lucinda is muted. Yes, you are. Could you unmute yourself? There you. I should be unmuted now. Um, everybody can hear me? Yes. Okay. They can't, um, they can't say, though, because I've asked them to keep themselves asked muted. them to all mute, yes. So, so thumbs up, you know, the little tools that let you give a thumbs up or a, or a applause or whatever, you, you should have those in your, um, in your toolbars. Anyways, um, I'm the executive director here at California Botanic Garden, um, but my role really today, my roles today are two. One is that I'm actually the, our native designer's biggest fan and, um, and enthusiast and, and popularizer. I say I'm Linda's sidekick. But then also I'm a, um, I'm a PhD plant scientist. And so um, I'm going to be giving you some insight on occasion to sort of why the, the, the plant science behind some of the things that Linda um, will, be, will be doing. She humors me by letting me um, say those kinds of things. Um, but first a little tiny bit of background on native designs and California in a vase. Um, some years ago, our garden gave its um, highest award for service to the California native flora to Susan Gottlieb. Um, she came to our annual gala, which is normally held in May, but hasn't been held for the last two years, and you know why. Um, and I believe that this is the arrangement that was on her table. Um, Susan fell in love with the arrangement immediately and said, I want to do that. Susan is a big fan of California native plants, as I think you know, and she's also a huge fan of flower arranging, but she actually, as the story goes, had not put the two together until she saw this arrangement and until she saw the work of our native designers. And so she and her, um, 
her uh, colleagues there at the Gottlieb Native Garden started doing these arrangements using their own plant materials. And then after her book came out on her native garden, um, she continued to the idea that we should do a book on um, native uh, designing with native plants. Um, but first, a little bit about our volunteer group that um, that uh, are Linda's uh, real sidekicks, partners in uh, in action here. Um, it's a, a wonderful group of uh, almost entirely women, I think, and they um, maintain a cutting garden here on the premises where they really focus on the plants that they find useful, and that's what the two ladies in the upper left are doing. Um, they cut plants um, when they're ready for them. They cut them so that they're uh, immediately fresh and and uh, ready to go. Well, no, I'm not going to say it that way. They cut them so that they can be conditioned in time to go into the arrangements uh, appropriately. Then in our, uh, and that's in the lower left, and then in our um, nursery head house, uh, they have a large workspace, not large enough, Linda would say, where they prepare arrangements. And that's what you see uh, Linda here in the upper right and uh, Shauna doing. And then the lower uh, right picture, which I love, is basically a whole group of the native designers posed together mm -hmm. happily at their um, at their their work table. Um, the uh, publishing the book, bringing the book out was a, um, a major endeavor, uh, which took a very long time, it seemed. And so we were super excited uh, when we when the book actually came out. Um, thanks to uh, Lily Colton here on the right, who was the book designer. She does a wonderful professional job. You're going to love your book when you um, when you get it. And again, I'm there in the dark glasses. Um, Lily's next to me. Linda is next to me. And this is Carol Petty, who I think she thinks is one of her um, major uh, co-leaders of the of the group. And yes, those are champagne glasses that are in our hands that you can see there. We are very, very happy in that um, in that uh, image. And that's in a, a beautiful garden area at uh, our garden out in Claremont. And I hope you will all come visit. And then here's the book that you are going to get, as Kathy said. Um, if you would like additional copies, once you get yours, if there's there may be other flower arrangers in your life um, who need a copy of this, you can actually buy it on Amazon, um, but we could probably also make an arrangement to get it to you more cost effectively. So get back in touch with me if you would um, are interested in uh, purchasing it. It's available actually at our little uh, gift shop at our entrance for $30. Um, so feel free to purchase more. Um, this is just a an inspiration to you here to plant um, to, to to plant native plants to use for floral arrangements. This is actually one that Linda did last spring for a um, a video like this, and this is a list of um, of plants that's suitable for a spring arrangement. Of course, it's no longer spring, as you know. Um, it really hasn't uh, rained to speak of since um, since May, and it's been fairly warm. And so today's arrangements are more, um, will we'll make use of the, the plants that still look good after a dry summer, hot, dry summer, and into the early fall. And Linda actually is going to do two arrangements for you today. One, um, she may need to do one pretty quickly to get you uh, uh, out of here or off of this Zoom, but we'll take, it, we'll take it as it comes. She's going to first do a vase, which she's going to use uh, the beautiful uh, silver foliage that we're blessed with here in California, as well as bright green foliage. And then she's going to do a centerpiece um, that will, you'll see, be more monochromatic than spring. So if we go back to that spring arrangement, it's got purples and yellows and pinks. And the, um, the spring flowering plants, the summer flowering plants tend to be dominated by the sunflower family, and they tend to be dominated by yellow flowers um, for reasons that we're not sure of, but that definitely seems to be the case. So these are the two pieces that we'll be making. And now Linda is going to launch into a live demonstration of the vase made with silver and green foliage. Take it away, Linda. All right. Good morning, everybody, and welcome. As uh, Kathy said, my name is Linda Prendergast, and I head up a group of volunteers, about 20 women, uh, that is called Native Designs. We garden up here on the Mesa on, in, on our 86-acre garden. We have probably a 50 by 50 plot where we try to grow flowers that are good for cutting. 
And as Lucinda said, it's a seasonal business for sure. Um, I came up through the flower business in my late 20s and early 30s. I put myself through college working in a flower shop. And then I retired from flowers and went into um, horticulture, into commercial wholesale growing. Uh, I enjoyed the flower shop probably more than any job I ever had. It was just wonderful. And if you work with flowers, you know what I mean. We're gonna do two simple arrangements, one in silver and then one in green and yellow. We're gonna do a vase arrangement and I'm gonna show you, here's the vase that I am going to use. And here's the vase as I would prepare it, but I'm using different colored tape because you wouldn't be able to see the cellophane. Putting marbles in the bottom of the vase to counterbalance the height of the arrangement. And then I put a grid of tape across. Can everybody see okay? Is, is Linda more than just a little tiny? Um, everybody's good? Okay, great. I've never been little tiny, Lucy. <laughs> and I love the introduction. Linda Prendergast assisted by Lucinda McDade, executive director. <laughs> I want that in my biography. <laughs> So I have made a grid across the top and then I would go around the outside edge to catch all that tape in case it gets, in case the vase is put into a refrigerator or gets wet accidentally. Um, that can mitigate the uh, stickiness of the tape. So this is how it looks. And, and Linda, you're doing this because otherwise uh, your arrangement would look like my arrangements which just have the stems all bunched up together right i just am using the green tape to illustrate how you grid the top of a vase but that's ugly on a on a clear vase you could do that on an opaque vase if it was green but this vase is also gridded you can see that but so we can't see it yeah can't see it and that's the whole purpose <laughs> When we harvest, uh, the, the plant material I'll be using today was all harvested yesterday and conditioned overnight, which means it was cut, taken down to the nursery, cleaned up, rinsed off, cut again and put into water that has a uh, preservative in it. And when we cut, we use typically a bypass pruner, either your hockey nose ones or the straight, can you see those? Yeah. Um, you don't want to use an anvil pruner because an anvil pruner will actually crush the stems. Anvil pruners are the kind where they, um, the two blades come together versus pass by, right? Right. And then, by the way, when, when she says, she, she, uh, she mentioned that you cut them in the field, obviously, where it's growing or in your garden, but then you make a fresh cut and you do that underwater, right, Linda? If we can, yes. Yeah, and the reason you're doing that is because there are cells in the plant stem that are like little miniature hoses, and those cells are full of water, and so you want to open a fresh cut so that the plant is able to take water into those cells and keep the 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 entire cutting fresh. That's what all of that is about, and it's really very very important. Um, because without water, plants really don't look good, as you know. So what are you doing there, Linda? I'm Making fresh cuts. And putting it down just to green up the vase. When you're doing a vase arrangement, um, you want to get the stems clear down to the bottom of the vase if you can. That way the plant material will take up sufficient water and last longer. So there's my stem. I'm cutting off all the foliage that would be underneath the water line, impaling it into the marbles to hold it steady. Why do you cut off the foliage that would be below the water line? 
the uh, water will get bacteria, <clears throat> excuse me, and the bacteria will lodge in the stems and won't let it drink up the water. Plus it turns the water that ugly, murky, looks like soup. No leaves below the surface of the water. Right. Let's just start with that as our basic. It's already beautiful. <laughs> this is Artemisia tridentata. I'm going to use the botanical names and Lucinda will correct me because I never say them right. Don't worry about pronunciation. It's about communication. <laughs> this is big brush, sagebrush, big, big, big sagebrush. It has a wonderful fragrance but you can see it's silver gray in contrast to the green of the pruner. And I'm just establishing the height of my arrangement now. And this will be very simple because we only have the three silver foliages to work with this year, this time of year. A wonderful thing about um, arranging with native plants, native flowers and foliage, is that arrangements, in my experience, last much, much, much longer than your standard arrangement. And um, also, they tend to smell wonderful. It's just wonderful to have a, a native design arrangement in your office or on your table. The secret to the uh... To any base arrangement, whether it's commercial flowers or natives, is to change the water every day. Just dump it out and replace it. We've got our basic vertical shape. We're going to add now some white sage, salvia apiana. That's the, the white sage. This is a good old workhorse, and it's it's one of the great flowers for summertime. It, and it's, that's not really a flower; it's foliage. Um, some of the natives depending on the time of year, go soft and you, you can't use them in an arrangement. They just will not hold up. But this, the sage is happy this time of year. Sage is a bulletproof plant. And this is the same sage that you've seen smudges made out of, where you can smudge your room and get rid of the bad vibes. <laughs> It's used as a smudge plant by the Native American, the indigenous people in our area, um, but it's being um, unfortunately overused and, um, and, and harvested illegally off of public lands and then sold commercially. So if you buy say uh, smudges, be really careful about the source of them. Linda, a question is, um, do you add new preservative every time you, every day when you change the water? If you can, it, it's, it the most important preservative is the first base. That's when the plants really take it up into their extremities up in the top. Otherwise you can just use regular water, but if you have enough packets of the preservative, yes, use preservative in each, each time you change the water. Yeah, those first few hours even, uh, and certainly the first overnight are critical in terms of the longevity of the plant. Keep them well hydrated, keep that preservative in there. That's beautiful. It's nice what you can do with monochromatic foliage. Now this is Costancia nevinii. Nevinii. Okay. 
you know, it kind of looks like Dusty Miller from your garden. But it's got a beautiful lacy Ooh. presentation. And you'll have all the names of these plants as a um, in this PowerPoint that you'll that we'll share with you, and also I will um, send you a, a list. And Linda, it looks like some of these stems your your pals have already removed the lower leaves from, or did they come that way? The gals that harvested yesterday took all the foliage off so that they could condition overnight and keep the water nice and clear. And yes, it's, uh, it's um, imperative that you take the foliage off. With How did you decide where to put the white sage? Uh, you establish the vertical, you establish the horizontal, and the white sage did both of that. Uh, That's so you're, you're basically using it to late. I'm sorry. You, go ahead, Linda. I'm just saying that's it. That's the way the vase is done. Can you see it? It's beautiful. So the wispy of the sagebrush establishes the verticality of it and gives it more than just kind of a gravy portal look. And but then you added the the um, the white sage, especially around the edges, but also the constancia. Um, adds a kind of a, a of a width to it, right? Yeah, kind of a, a filler. And you can go back if you have holes and you have extra material, you can um, just fill in where you think it needs a little oomph. There you go. That's beautiful. We do this sometimes as a class for our um, for people who um, sign up for the class and they can come to our garden and get a pail with all the plant materials and a bag with the various um, the the vase and the marbles and all of that and um, and then they take pictures of their um, of their arrangements and they you can do a really good job um, by by you'll you'll have this PowerPoint so you'll be able to slow it down and you know, go through it and make your own arrangement. So Linda, I'm gonna go back to share to sharing. Stop, stop now, because we're gonna tell them what species went into this, remember? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so hold on there. Let me share screen again. I, do I need, to, I probably need to pin myself again in order to be able to... Um... Pin, either pin or spotlight, Lucinda. Okay. All right, let's see if this works. Let me share screen again. Can everybody see that? I can see it, thank you. Okay, good. So this is the Constancia nevinii, the Nevin's woolly sunflower that Kathy said is one of her favorites as well. It's really a gorgeous plant. It's gorgeous in flower um, and you can, you, you use the flowers sometimes, right, Linda? Yes. Absolutely. It's glorious in flower. This is big sagebrush, the Artemisia tridentata. And in one of the reasons that scientists don't like common names is that there's about 20 different things that are called sage. And you may be thinking this thing should have purple flowers like our, um, our uh, other group of sages, which are in a completely different plant family. Actually, the flowers of the Artemisia tridentata are these little bumps along the, um, along the stem. So it's not very related. It's not related at all really to our other sages um, like hummingbird sage and Cleveland sage, those kinds of things, which are also wonderful plants, by the way. What they have in common is fragrance. That's where the, the common name sage comes from. Sage. The holly leaf cherry that Linda used mm. is, is one of our greenest plants in, in, um, in the native flora. Um, also, uh, one of the uh, most rapidly growing in my experience, I have one in our home garden that sprang up to nearly 20 feet tall in no time whatsoever. And it stays bright green if you're looking for something that stays bright green all year round with very little um, water, this is your plant. Some people are annoyed by the 
by the fruits um, that yes, do drop on the ground. Um, my take on that is humans make a lot more um, extra stuff than this prunus does. So the flowers are not a not hugely uh, glorious um, and the fruits are really not edible. There's just a tiny uh, um, surface of uh, fruit on a big, big seed. And but so what you plant it for really is foliage. It's great for shade. The Catalina currant, Ribes viburnifolium, is a wonderful plant, really good for shade. If you have space under oaks or some other shade trees where you'd like a native plant, Catalina currant is your plant. It only gets to, you know, maybe maybe knee high on a on a tall woman, uh, maybe um, thigh high. Um, and it uh, is not really known for its flowers, although they're very pretty. Um, again, it's really known for its, its uh, foliage. This is what it looks like. Here it is in kind of a mass planting at our garden under, um, under an oak. It's, a, re again, reliably evergreen with very little water. Okay, and then I, um, I have an image of the white sage later on in the talk. So you'll, you'll see that uh, just a little bit later. So now Linda is going to show us how to uh, make a centerpiece, and she's going to be using the same foliage as in the vase that she just made for us. And you're going to notice that the flowers that she's using, as we said, are more monochromatic um, because it's summer and um, uh, we're dealing mainly with sunflowers and they tend to be yellow. This arrangement is going to be done in Oasis, the wet floral foam. So we prepared the bowl yesterday. I let Oasis soak for a good 24 hours before I use it. The box says you can soak it for 15 minutes, but I often find that there's dry spots in it if it's not soaked overnight. Where do you get one of these things, Linda? Where do you get an Oasis? We buy the Oasis at an outfit called Floral Supply Syndicate, uh, which is open to the public. Um, you could also get it at Michael's or at Hobby Lobby. Same goes with the tape. The, um, the green tape comes in a roll that looks like this. When it's packaged, it comes wrapped in plastic. So it, our brand is Capri. And then the um, cellophane tape comes from the same company, also by Capri. You don't buy more than one roll. That's all you need. Um, I'm proceeding with the prunus, the, the cherry, and just greening this up. Should look. So you've got your you've got your oasis, and you taped it down into the uh, makeup bowl. And you've got your what did you call it? A makeup bowl? Makeup bowl. Okay. Stock bowl. You could use any bowl, soup bowl. Um, but this has little spikes in the bottom that you push the oasis down and it goes, it, it impales itself. Linda, how long do you think that um, the uh, foliage vase would last? A long time. A week, a week or 10 days if you change the water. Yeah. And Kathy's pointed out that um, bees love the the prunus flowers, the holly leaf cherry flowers, and they and they do. Have you seen native bees on it or just honeybees? Uh, really not sure. How Honey, uh, native bees actually tend to be either much larger or much smaller than honeybees, <laughs> which are kind of the quintessential medium sized bee. <laughs> And we have a lot of native bees. Someone told me at a party once that all California native bees have gone extinct, and that's absolutely not true. Yes, in one of our Gottlieb presentations, we learned that there are over 500 species of native bees in Southern California, in LA County. Yeah, a lot of them are ground nesting. And one of the things that, um, that bee people will tell you is that um, most native bees uh, really won't sting you. You have to really provoke them to get them to sting you. It's, it's the honeybees that are stinging. So Linda, what have you done now? You've, you've, this one you started differently because you 
establish sort of the 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 width of it, right? Why? What I'm doing is covering the oasis, so that okay. um, so that our underwear isn't showing. You never want your oasis to show, and you never want the tape to show um, over the side of the bowl. So Just like you don't want your underwear to show. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Laura's terms, that's called covering your underwear. <laughs> that would let people know how the sausage is made if they could see the oasis, right? <laughs> um, I'm going to start with the sunflowers. We have the sunflowers, helianthus, and we have Erica Maria. Did I say that right, Lisa? Yes, you did, huh? This is um, more of a mustard color, but it will be a good contrast. This shrub, uh, the one that we harvested from is, is tall. It's about six feet tall. And it's a, it's a good cut flower. It's, it's, it's feathery looking. Um, it's got a nice clustered head on it. And it's a good filler flower. Let's start with the sunflower. Sunflowers can be very hard to work with because they get really crooked stems. They tend to come with really crooked stems or the stems get crooked? They grow with crooked stems. Hmm. Now, you might or might not have seen, you see the length of this? This is going to go clear down to the bottom of the oasis. You don't want to put your flowers in, so it's just going in a half an inch. I mean, it'll stand up, but it won't last. You want to push it clear down to the bottom of the bowl so that it can take up water for a long time. And the water is available only at the base of the oasis. The top of it will dry out. Even if you keep your arrangement watered, the top of the oasis is going to dry out? Just, it's just gravity feed. The water moves down. Hmm. So how are you deciding where to put the sunflowers? The sunflowers are going to be all over the arrangement. So I'm establishing the outside width with the sunflowers. They're the most important flower in the arrangement. They're the largest. Yeah. They love their little dark centers, a happy little sunflower face. And that's where the real flowers are, you know? That's right. Sunflowers are in the, a common name for the sunflower family is the composite family. And the reason they're called composite family is because each of those flower-like things is actually a composite of many flowers, many individual flowers. And if you look hard at the center, you can actually convince yourself that that's where the individual flowers are. So each of those things that Linda's handling probably has a hundred individual flowers each. See what we mean about dominated by yellow in the late summer? When you have an assortment of sizes within a variety, like we have on the sunflowers, we have big sunflowers. This one is fairly large. And then this guy, by contrast, is small. You want to put your larger flowers toward the base of the arrangement just to give it a weight. Mm -hmm. It's going to look more natural with the bigger flowers at the bottom. And with the oasis, uh, you don't want to put your flower in, pull it out, put your flower in, pull it out, put it in. You want to select your spot, give it a fresh cut, and place it where it goes. If you have to remove it to replace it, you need to cut the stem each time. And that's all about those little hose-like things that are that are individual cells on end and run the length of the whole stem getting plugged up. 
you put them in a few times, take them out, put them in, they're going to be plugged up with Oasis material or just from the um, force of, of sticking them in. So that's why to make a new, a new cut each time, really critical. from the bottom of the stem see how when I when I put this in I'm holding it at the top but I'm pushing with this hand so that I don't bend the stem because once the stem is bent it's not going to take up water it's all over so holding it down low pushing it into the oasis cheerful and happy. It is. Okay, the Erythromeria is going to go in a little bit deeper. You mean lower? Deeper in, um, deeper in depth into the oasis than the sunflowers, because okay. that's, this is the background flower. It's the ugly stepsister. <laughs> oh, it's a nice plant. Not as nice as a sunflower. So how are you deciding where to put that one? You're going toward the base and again in between the sunflowers. Mm -hmm. it, that mustard color is a good contrast. It is nice. It also looks good with the prunus up against the color of the prunus. Questions, anybody? Don't forget to drop questions into the into the chat. general rule of thumb when you're arranging any of the flowers is to work in uneven numbers, uh, three of this, five of that, seven of another thing, instead of two, four, six, eight. You don't want the, um, you don't want too much symmetry. <laughs> How do you know when you've put in enough, Linda? When it is visually pleasing, <laughs> when, it, when it is all the um, when the oasis is covered and the the foliage is still viewable but not um, but not the primary vision. I'm going to do a tube of. Balia. Oh, this so what are these? Is, this plant is Balia. And it's a it, it's a great all around, it blooms almost all the time. It's, it's one of my favorites, but it's tiny. And this time of year, its stems are a little bit weak. Um, when it's cooler, they are they're stiffer. So I'm going to take a water tube and a. So show us that water tube, put it up by the cell. Yeah. And you get those also at floral supply. Right. They come in a big bag. And then I have a, a floral pick, which you can buy at Hobby Lobby or Michael's. And I'm going to use stem tape to attach the tube to the stake. Because the tube won't stick in the oasis by itself. No. It's got a <laughs> bottom. 
Are you putting water in it? I am going to put water in it, yes. Don't forget the water in your... <laughs> it doesn't take much, obviously. It's very easy to overflow it, which is why she's working on a uh, plastic tablecloth there. <laughs> What do you do in your in your once your arrangement is ready? Do you worry about the floral tubes when you water it more? Yeah, you're going to have to replace the water and the floral tubes every single day. Well, you don't have to replace it; you just have to top it off. So just use that same little water pitcher that you just used, uh, and or a turkey baster. Oh, a turkey baster! That's a new application for a turkey baster. So you're going to put all of those into one floral tube? They are all in one tube. And that tube is going to go right in the middle. And that's your vertical component? That's just your kind of happy um, surprise in the arrangement. <laughs> Balea multiradiata desert sunflower. It's a it's a great plant, super great. The Ribes viburnifolium is one of my favorite foliages. It's small, uh, grows in the shade, as Lucinda said, and has a lovely fragrance, kind of lemony. And this I'm just going back in to kind of finish off the arrangement, finishing touches. And so you're you're using that to fill it out, to fill any spaces where there seem to be gaps. And to kind of counterbalance and repeat the size of the balea. Um, Wait, say that again. I'm using it to repeat the size of the balea. See how oh. huh. for continuity. Interesting. Gosh, that's gorgeous. Linda, some of the Erica Marias are a little bit sort of past peak flower. Did they get chosen on purpose for that, or is that just the status of the plant? No, I, I told the gals to get Eric America and they Eric America and they did the best they could. This is a little bit fresher, but um, this time of year, you know, it's slim pickings. Yeah. Um, but the nice thing about the book, the California and of Oz book, everybody, is that it's organized by season. And so, you know, you're not just looking at spring arrangements all year round, thinking how sad it is it's not spring anymore. For each season of the year, you've got suggestions that are appropriate. And if you know they're if they're um, appropriate out here in Claremont, they're fine where you all are too. So you'll have ideas. And you know, ne necessarily at some like in the middle of the winter, if you're doing arrangements for um, the holidays, th they may be simpler arrangements than um, during the spring when everything is in full abundance and. That's the beauty of designing with natives. You're uh, following the seasons and celebrating the seasons and the plants that look good in each of the seasons. Most of the native plants, uh, the flowers are small. Um, the sage is really the largest that we get. And then uh, in early spring, the uh, Matilaha poppy is always a, a very dramatic um, large flower. But the others generally are small. and and most often they're columnar, like woolly blue pearls or um, pinstamen. Um, they have tubes, floral tubes. Yeah. Yeah. We're finished here. Isn't that beautiful? 
So Linda, put the two arrangements side by side. Just what a what a um, what a difference the one that is um, silver and green, and then the one that is quite floriferous. Some really good ideas for you. Very nice, very very nice. In the springtime, uh, my favorites are uh, redbud, um, woolly blue curls. Uh, rosy buckwheat, uh, coral bells, of course, is always lovely, and um, well, the white sage. So, I, right. It's, so, it's I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna finish showing the slides now, and then we'll go back and we can answer questions. Um, Linda didn't use the constancia or the artemisia for this one, but just to remind you that they're in the um, previous arrangement. Um, the, the holly leaf cherry is a major workhorse, as is the Ribes viburnifolium when you want beautiful green, long lasting foliage. Um, here's the Erica Maria, Parrish's rabbit brush, lovely, lovely plant. Um, here's the common sunflower, Helianthus annuus. Cheery, very, very cheery. Our, the ground squirrels love them at our garden. They climb all the way up them to, to eat the flowers. They're very annoying. Here's the desert marigold, Balea multiradiata. As Linda said, once you get it started, it flowers almost all year round. It's a great plant in the garden. It also has beautiful gray foliage. Do you ever use the foliage, Linda? No. No, it's not, a, it's not abundant enough, I think. It's all down at the base of the flower. So yeah, so that doesn't work. But it is very pretty gray foliage and, and fuzzy, pubescent, as you can as you can see here. Gorgeous thing. On the, the photo on the left there, you can see that each of those each of those little things is actually an independent flower, a completely separate flower. You didn't use end up using the goldenrod, but that's also a great one. Um, and then this is a bonus for you. Here are Linda's favorites for the designer, for the native designer starter garden. So this is like a shopping list that you can take to uh, bring to our gardens nursery once we open in the middle of October or take to Theodore Payne or um, a few other places that, um, that emphasize natives. Uh, they're still few and far between in terms of nurseries that emphasize natives, but you can get these. So California poppy, St. Catherine's lace, Douglas iris, yellow lupin, penstemons of various sorts, alum root, coral bells, uh, woolly blue curls, toyone, sugar bush, and then I'm going to show you white sage at the end there. Are there others, Linda, that that we sh that you would add to this list? Today's obviously. So there you have the, you know uh, California poppy, beautiful orange poppies. This is a very simple right. A uh, little arrangement. You made these so that each table at a at an event got one of these little um, arrangements. With the the facelia, which is we don't use very often um, because it's so precious. But yes, facelia. the purple is facelia, uh, and then this is a spring arrangement. These things are in the spring. Um, the the desert marig. I mean, I'm sorry. The California poppy comes in various color varieties that have uh, spontaneously occurred and been selected. This one is, um, I think it's, it's called mahogany um, and you can buy a seed pack of this. And then this one with the deep orange blush and the yellow edges is quite attractive as well. There you see some variation. St. Catherine's Lace, Areogonum giganteum is a, um, a spectacular plant. And talk about how you use this one, Linda. That it's almost used like baby's breath. It, it comes with in a big, there's probably three huge uh, panicles on a stem and you, we cut the, each one off and then use it individually. But it, it, it fills in for baby's breath. It also dries beautifully if you hang it upside down. It's beautiful dry and it's beautiful when it's fresh both ways. And bees love this one too. You see the bees on that? There it is in an arrangement with a Dudleya. Wow, nice. Irises. Oh, early 
early in the season, yes, Douglas Iris. They don't last very long, but boy, they have a lot of impact. Yeah, beautiful. They're single day flowers, really. Um, here's here's the here's the iris here on the on the left, and then white sage and some penstemons you'll see in a minute. The Douglas iris comes in various color morphs too. Lupin. Oh, lupin. This this is just so prolific. Uh, we have a couple of flower beds in the native designs garden. And when it comes into bloom, it's a showstopper. And it's one of the ones that when you cut it and put it in water, it still elongates like a tulip does. It just it gets longer while it's in the vase. It keeps growing. That's that's because it has botanically speaking an indeterminate inflorescence, which means it keeps growing. These are more flower buds up here um, and over here. And if you do if you've done your job well and um, and cut the stem fresh and, and kept it in water and freshen the water, these will continue to, to grow and open new flowers. There it is in an arrangement, a yellow themed arrangement. It's a great plant. Penstemon. There are lots of species of penstemon and I think you like almost any of them, don't you, Linda? Spectabilis, isn't it? Or is it yes. Margarita Box? Yeah. It, uh, they all work very, very well in arrangements and they last a pretty long time. And boy, they can be, they're tall, so they can give you some real drama in an arrangement. Well, and you're using it here to establish the width, the whole width of the, of the centerpiece, right? That centerpiece. Now that was in springtime and you can see the Balea there is in flower. In the oasis. It's not in flower tubes. Uh, and I think there's what monkey flower in there too. This yellow here looks like monkey flower, and then you've also got a Romnia, a uh, fried eggplant uh, poppy. Yeah, that's a terrific, um, terrific arrangement. And when you when you make an arrangement to serve uh, at, as a centerpiece, be sure that the people will be able to see each other over it. That rule is not often is not always followed in my experience. <laughs> Some penstemons for you. We have a um, these come up. The spectabilis comes up spontaneously in our garden, and in spring, it's just spectacular. It's really something. These things can be what five feet tall. They can. I, oh, I hope you come out to the garden and see them. Come in March or April, May. They're just they're just spectacular. Go out in the communities, and they they're everywhere. Yeah, they're really great. So this is coral bells or alum root um, heuchera. Uh, again, a, a plant that is um, great under oaks in the, it likes it a bit shady. It doesn't really want full sun. And then in the spring, they put forth these long stalks of delicate pink flowers. Um, usually pink, you can get ones that are white and some that are more reddish, but pink is certainly the dominant color. And talk about how you use these, Linda. Uh, the coral bells is mixed with the cremontodendron or cremontia in, in this space. And that is a big flowering tree. Uh, we cut it sparingly because it is a tree, but a uh, very dramatic, fuzzy leaf. Um, some people get irritated, their skin gets irritated when they touch it, but it doesn't bother me any, but uh, very, very pretty. That's the that's the Fremontia, yeah, Fremontodendron. And then you use the coral bells to for the height here, right? Right. And then the on the that is mallow right there. Right. right. Sphoralcia. That comes in an apricot color and a pink color. And that's that's a great shrub for landscaping. It's a, a decent size and it's it behaves itself. And but yeah. you love it. Right. And then you've got monkey flower here too, the yellow, yeah. More of uh, this is what the the flowering parts of the alum root or the coral. You see why they call it coral bells. Woolly blue curls. One of my very favorites. A fabulous fragrance to it. A lemony, wonderful, clean smell. Even if you just pull the foliage off of it and put the foliage in a bowl or a, a saucer and let it sit dry out, it's like a potpourri. It's a great plant. 
And you're using it here for height? Uh, for height, yes, and, and drama, basically. It has beautiful line. You can get, some of the woolly bull curls are straight, like in the arrangement on the left-hand side, and some of them will curl most interestingly, uh, kind of recurve, and they make a very interesting arrangement to look at. Yeah, and so you have some old favorites already coming here, right? You've got your white sage that you recognize. White sage, uh, and I think, is that yarrow that's in the yellow? That's, that's yarrow, yeah, and then you've also got your cherry. You can see that Linda uses cherry a lot, um, emphasizes that um, for just that beautiful, rich green color. Are those Toyon berries? The yeah, these, this is Toyon over here. And I think we have another a slide of Toyon in a minute. Yeah. yeah that's really. That's available right now is coffee berry. Yeah, right. So yeah. That's, just, it's, uh, that's also a good thing to use. It, it, very interesting when it starts turning black. Uh, it comes out light green and then it changes colors into black. And it the berries like of the coffee green. berry? Yeah. Yeah. Woolly blue curls. Here's the Toyon. Um, this is the yellow fruited one. The, the wild type is red. And then a yellow fruited um, selection called Davis Gold has been selected as well. So you can get a yellow one or a, or a red one. This gets to be a very large, you can prune it to be a tree or uh, let it be a, a big shrub. Um, and uh, evergreen needs next to no water once established. It's really a great plant. And Linda uses it quite a bit. Here's the berries when they're green, right? And berries, this is the red, the red berried one over here. This looks like a holiday arrangement. And I think, and the, the berries usually are reddish at the holidays. Right. Yeah. Just like California holly. Right. That's one of its common names. There's the yellow fruited Davis gold and the red default. And then there's sugar bush. Sugar bush is an outstanding, long last, you know, that lasts so long in an arrangement, you'll get tired of it. it, it it's <laughs> a flower. There, this is the sugar bush right here, right in the middle. You're kind of the kind of the focal point, right? Right. And then here it is in this wreath, this beautiful wreath that you made. Yeah, along with Toyon, this is a uh, clearly a seasonal wreath, and you, there's a wreath design in the in the California in a vase book as well. We uh, make our uh, grapevine wreaths. We harvest the grapevines uh, typically on Martin Luther King Day. Although I think next year we're going to change it to uh, St. Patrick's Day because they were in better shape. But we make the the wreaths and then we decorate them with artificials and sell them at our plant sale in the fall. They're gorgeous and they last a really long time. This is actually the flowers open of the, uh, of the sugar bush. And then white sage, another real workhorse in the garden. Be sure to plant your own if you wanna use it in arrangements. Remember that it's being harvested illegally. Um, so really don't buy smudges unless you for sure know where they are from. Uh, the flowers are probably the least spectacular of any of our native sages, uh, but they're still nice. If you look at them closely, they're quite amazing. But the silver foliage is just um, is just gorgeous and, and very dramatic, I think. Don't you, Linda? I agree. I agree. That it's just a good old workhorse. Yeah. And that's what we uh, what we have for you in terms of, of slides, and um, we are happy to answer questions. There's one question in chat right now. What plants need the to need the floral tubes, Linda? Uh, it, it was the Balia, the uh, desert marigold. And why? It the stems are too weak this time of year to plunge into the oasis. In the springtime, when we have California poppies, we frequently put the poppies into a tube also because they have little skinny stems and they, they just can't take the force of being pushed down into the oasis. So this works and they can take up water. Your longest lasting arrangement is going to be one that's in water, not in oasis. The oasis will, will hold fine, but not as long as a deep base arrangement. 
Very good. Um, do you want people to continue to use chat or shall we unmute ourselves and ask our questions? Either way, whatever works for you. Okay. Uh, first of all, let me say, this is Kathy talking. I, I just loved this. I don't know a lot about flower arranging and I now feel enabled. I'm fortunate to have planted lots of natives in my garden and so... I'm going to town. I wrote down the name of the supply place, which uh, you use. I have it written here. It's, uh, it's Floral Supply Syndicate, open to the public. Thank you for that. Thank you for so many things um, I learned today, including just about natives in general and insects. Uh, thank you, Linda and Lucinda. And now, um, if other people want to ask questions, this is your moment. You can unmute yourself and ask your question. All right, then, um, then I'm going to say thank you on behalf of all of us. I uh, appreciate everything you've done for us today. This has been a real highlight for me. I did preview this book, California in a Vase. And if I don't win it today, I'm going to buy it. I love it. I love this book. I love what you do. Um, One of the things we could easily do is ship you all a box of them. I forget 16 come in a box or something like that. So we could, we could arrange to do that if you wanted to save on shipping costs and um, but buy a box, just be back in touch with me, Kathy, if you wanna orchestrate something like that. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Lucinda. Mm -hmm. um, then I think we're ready to have our drawing. Oh, I see there's a couple of questions in chat. Also Michaels, Lucinda said, yes, you did say that. And um, what plants need the tubes? Okay, all of that is answered. There's just more Michaels than there are floral supply syndicate outlets. Sure. So thank you so much. I'm going to um, I'm going to go to our little uh, book drawing device, and you are welcome to stay with us, um, but you don't need to. Everyone, um, show your appreciation by either putting a smiley face in or unmute and thank you. Thank you so much. I I just love it. I love. California Botanic Garden. A couple of garden club members and I went out this summer and even on hot days, that place is beautiful and fragrant. It absolutely is and welcome and please come again. Our Grow Native Nursery will open in the middle of October that weekend. I think it's the 16th, 17th, 17th, 18th um, is the weekend that our Grow Native Nursery will open. And as far as we know, at this point, it will be an in-person store um, this year. We've been running it virtually since spring of 2020, but uh, we intend to open it um, for in-person shopping. So make a list and come on out. Should we like order online first just for pickup or? Yeah, I think we're going to take down the online store um, okay. for a whole variety of reasons. Um, one is that the software that we're using is either a physical store or an online store. So we're doing it physically, but you can easily, we will post the inventory uh, every week and you're uh, welcome to uh, communicate with us as well to ask about availability. Um, it's just gnn at calbg.org for Grow Native Nursery. And I just put that email in the, uh, and all, we have, there's a very good website for the GNN as well once it's up and running, so. I appreciate that. Thank you again so much. Thank you. We enjoyed it. We always have a good time. Right, Linda? <laughs> and, and also, you did such a great job with the technical stuff. I feel like I learned a lot here at the end of it all. Well, that's good. It's always good to learn more of the nuances of Zoom, huh? <laughs> yeah. Great. Beautiful. Very nice to meet you all, and uh, please come visit. We'll see you soon. Thank you. I'm going to say thank you. Thank you. Yeah. thank you. Absolutely. Grow native. They last longer. They make arrangements that smell better. 
you'll never go back to FTD, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> and, and beautiful creatures will come to your yard. <laughs> also, absolutely also, yeah, yeah. Thank Wonderful. you, this was great. Thank you Thank so much. You. You're you. very welcome. Thank you for your interest. All right, I'm stopping the recording now.